How do you think kids learn to talk? Um, by imitating their, fa their mothers and the people around them. I guess their parents teach them, people around them. Children learn language from their parents or who's ever rearing them or raising them. Yes. I think that, uh, that uh, a baby would imitate what he hears, yes. This is part two of a series on the human language. Where's Cookie Monster? Why Cookie Monster? How do children acquire language without seeming to learn it? In advance of experience, the child is already equipped with an understanding of the basic structure of any human language. Show me your At the age of three, there are many things a child can't do, can't perform uh, mathematical operations like a multiplication or division or even subtraction. But it only takes a short amount of time to get a kid to be a member of a language community such that he can infer reliably from the noises that people make to their states of mind. Papa. How on earth does he do it? Papa. Papa. Either it's there at birth or he has to learn it. <laughs> now, do birds teach their young to fly? Do mothers teach their children how to speak? Well, I really don't know whether birds teach their young to fly or not, though I suspect not, but I'm certain that mothers don't teach their children to talk. This part of our series is about a great mystery. How do children acquire language without seeming to learn it? How do they know so many things with so little life experience to go on? A problem posed by Plato 2,000 years ago. How do children know how to walk and run around? How to pick up things with their fingers? How to use grammar effortlessly without lessons? How do they do it? Approaches to Plato's problem have changed in recent years. And linguists credit one man with newly raising the issue and profoundly influencing their thoughts. Noam Chomsky. Well, there is a, a, a general view that learning language is just like learning, solving any other problem. That we have certain general ways of solving problems, call them mechanisms of general intelligence. We apply them to this task, to that task, to the other task. It's the same mechanisms. Uh, one of the problems is acquiring language. Uh, there's another approach which suggests that, uh, which, uh, that, in fact, the brain is like every other uh, system in the biological world. That is, it's highly differentiated into subsystems of special design and structure, and that one of these happens to have a special design for acquiring language. Chomsky has argued, to my mind, convincingly, that uh, many of the processes of mental computation involved in the normal use of language are inherited. You're born with them. They're in your genetic makeup. Coded in the DNA the way it's coded in the DNA of a human being that uh, he's going to uh, develop arms instead of wings. And then if it's, as it were, coded in the genes, it's not surprising that we're all good at it. It's like we're all good at having hair or something. Having two arms, as Chomsky likes to say. Walking is presumably encoded in your DNA. It's uh, part of the uh, innate uh, program of human beings in their development that they're going to learn to walk and not learn to uh, fly. And perhaps not learn to climb very well. But they'll learn to walk terrifically well. We are designed to walk. Uh, it, it's, an, it's actually an open question to what extent a child has to be in an environment of walking people in order to walk. But that we are designed to walk is certain. Uh, that we are taught to walk is impossible. Uh, and pretty much the same is true of language. Nobody's taught language. In fact, you can't prevent a child from learning it. It's probably a mistake to even use the word learning in connection with language acquisition. 
as far as we understand it, it has very much the properties of, uh, of normal physical growth. So much of the what's called controversy uh, about uh, Chomsky's approach uh, appears to arise from people's belief that they have to man this barricade on one side or the other. Either language is built in, uh, as birdsong, let us say, is built in, or uh, it is wholly learned uh, by, uh, from exposure to specific properties of the environment. Why can't it be both? In fact, I take it that this is the question of modern linguistics. How much of language does a child have to learn? And how much is built in? Jill de Villiers at Ooh. Smith College can show that children know more than we think they do. Here's a story about a boy who loved to climb trees in the forest. But one afternoon, he slipped and fell to the ground. That night when he had a bath, he found a big bruise on his arm. He said to his dad, I must have hurt myself when I fell this afternoon. When did the boy say he hurt himself? Climbed up a tree. Oh, right, he did. When he was taking a bath. Oh, when he was taking a bath. In the bathtub. In the bathtub, uh-huh. When he fell down from the tree. That's right. When did the boy say he hurt himself? After he when he fell. When, when he, he fell, fell this afternoon. <laughs> Any other possibilities? In the, in the bathtub. In the bathtub. There are two possibilities. Well, he said it in the bathtub, and he hurt himself in the afternoon. That night when he had a bath, he found a big bruise on his arm. He said to his dad, I must have hurt myself when I fell this afternoon. When did the boy say how he hurt himself? In the bathtub. Mm -hmm. um, when he was bath. When he was in the bath, you're right. So where's the other answer? When did the boy say how he hurt himself? Why isn't it when he fell out the tree that afternoon? Give us the two again, side by side. When did the boy say he hurt himself? When did the boy say how he hurt himself? The presence of that middle question, how, seems to block one of the interpretations. This is not the kind of sentence anybody has ever taught them about. They haven't had lessons sitting down with their parents saying, no, 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 you misinterpreted what I meant. I meant this. I would think that the child would have to already have some kind of knowledge of grammar and syntactical structure. This is the claim. When did the boy say how he hurt himself? When he was taking a bath. Mm -hmm. It's the imitation theory versus the innateness theory. Now listen, I'm going to teach you to say something very important. It might be the most important word you ever learned. Okay? And that word is Ernie. Okay? Go ahead, say it. Say, Ernie. People often ask, what's the big problem about a child learning grammar? Doesn't the child just imitate what he or she hears, get reinforced one way or another, and end up knowing the language? OK, listen. Here's er, knee, er, knee, er, knee, er, knee. Now you just say, Ernie, okay? Our common sense theory about how children learn to talk is that they listen to their parents and they imitate their parents. But every child, like every adult, can produce brand new sentences that that child has never heard before and never produced before. I hate you, mommy. Now, come on. You didn't learn this from your mother. You just have to listen to a three-year-old for a few minutes to realize that they're not simply imitating what they hear from their parents. I've heard children say things like, stop giggling me, or my teacher holded the baby rabbits, or my nose is crying when the child's nose was running, or I'm barefoot all over. It's a very funny sort of imitation. Now, Ernestine, look, watch. Er, knee. 
Ernie. If we don't learn by imitation, how do we learn? And it's one of the linguist's strongest arguments that acquiring language is different from learning. Because we don't seem to learn language the same way we learn other difficult things. With learning how to ride a bicycle, we all remember being told how to get on it, falling off. We even had training wheels, but we never give training wheels when we're learning language. In fact, what we know is that when mothers try and help their children learn language by making it simpler, the children systematically ignore the information that's being given to them. I don't know why he says pajamas. I mean, jamamas, because I say pajamas, right? Jamamas. Jamamas? What about pajamas? Can you say pajamas? Pajamas. We come to cherish our children's errors rare as they are, they're so cute. When my little girl would say she wanted to make wee-wee, I would say the word is urinate. Urinate, I said. The word is urinate. Urinate, dear. Hi, I'm in it. We know that some mothers correct their children, but we also know that not all mothers do. <laughs> and we know that all children learn to speak. It doesn't seem to matter how many times I correct him. He still says Jamamas. He likes that word. Jamamas. Mothers are important because they provide a lot of the data. The kid makes a noise and the mother expands on it and that sort of thing. But children don't copy what's done around them. They acquire language by being surrounded by it, immersed in it all the time. The philosopher Wittgenstein said that children acquire speech by playing the language game. A game in which mothers often seem to imitate their children. Ready? Okay. Sammy is three and a half years old. How much grammar does he know? We know. What do you think um, Quirky Master eats? What? What do you think Quirky Master eats? Oh, I think Cookie Monster eats maybe pizza? Goodness. Try again. And maybe he likes to eat cookies. Cookies and what else? Ice cream? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a tough one, Sammy. I'll give you a guess. Uh, or I'll give you a hint. Okay. It starts with a K. Oh, it starts with a K. Um, what do you think um, um, Quirky Monster eats? With a K? Maybe cake. Right! Okay. Cookie. What do you think Cookie Monster eats? It's really rather remarkable that such a young child can produce such a complicated sentence. This is a complex sentence that has one sentence inside another. Cookie Monster eats something inside the larger sentence. You think Cookie Monster eats something. Then it's been changed into a question. And the way it's changed into a question is something is changed into what. And then what is displaced from the very end of this long sentence to the very beginning. But the child was able to do it unerringly. Now, it has been thought uh, for a while that uh, children take uh, 5, 8, 10, 12 years to learn their syntax, to learn how to produce such complicated sentences. But experiments like these seem to indicate that a child was able to produce this very complicated sentence at an age when he has difficulty tying his shoes. Just do the bow part for me, would you, Sammy? One more? Yeah, one more bow. Any four-year-old can pull it off with almost the facility that any 34-year-old can. It's quite a remarkable achievement, and one which comes intuitively, naturally, unconsciously. Nothing, nothing troubles us about it. No matter how young you investigate them, they seem to get all of these fundamental syntactic things right. And nobody can teach that to the child. I think that's one of Chomsky's most powerful arguments.
This is something the child has to figure out on his own or on her own. Chomsky is often misunderstood as uh, claiming that all of language is innate. Now, I would go so far as to say that most of language is innate. That is, much of what you know when you know a language, you couldn't possibly have learned because you never had evidence for it. You never had training in it, but surely you don't inherit all of it. Certainly nobody is saying that French is innate uh, or Spanish is innate. I mean, there is no argument of this sort. There's a sense in which uh, language is obviously learned uh, from uh, specific facts uh, in the surrounding environment. The environment certainly uh, has an effect. So, for example, I'm talking English, I'm not talking Japanese, uh, and that's because I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, not in uh, northeastern Tokyo. So uh, experience is certainly relevant. What Chomsky has shown is that um, there's much beyond experience that's relevant. That is, uh, much of what you know when you know a language you had no experience for, couldn't possibly have learned. A handsome prince came, and a little girl came out and laid on the couch, and a big, a big girl came out, and she had a thing around here, and she took it off and put it on a, laid it on a girl. And the child is able to say sentences that he or she has never heard before. And then she... Well, how could this be done? And then she walked around and she saw a handsome prince, and then snow came down. It could not be, there being so many sentences, that the child has just heard all of these sentences and memorized them all. And then we went in and watched the movie. There is a traditional semi-answer to this, and that is we do it by analogy. Uh, new sentences are like the ones we've heard before, and that's how we understand them. Well, let's have a look at that. So suppose we assume the child has heard the sentence, uh, I painted the red bone. So now by analogy, the child can say, I painted a blue bone. That's exactly the kind of theory that we want. You hear a sample and you extend it uh, to all of the new cases uh, by similarity. That's the right theory. In addition to, I painted a red barn, you may also hear the sentence, I painted a barn red. So it looks as if you can take those last two words and switch them around in their order. That sounds good. So now you want to extend this to the case of seeing, because now you want to look at barns instead of painting them. So you have heard, uh, I saw a red barn. So now you try, new sentence, um, I saw a barn red. I saw a red barn. I saw a barn red. Alarm, something's gone wrong. This is an analogy, but the analogy didn't work. Uh, it's not a sentence of English. Even from these simple examples, we can see at once that concepts like analogy are not going to do very much work. In fact, there is no, no one has ever proposed a concept of analogy that uh, doesn't break down at once under investigation. In fact, these examples show us that some kind of mental computation is going on that is providing rather surprising results. Suppose that a child has learned to understand the word eat. He knows that somebody does the eating, something gets eaten. He understands John ate an apple. He's now faced with John ate. Well, the child understands that. Uh, he or she knows that John ate means John ate something or other. Harrow ate his sandwich. But suppose that he hadn't eaten his sandwich. Suppose that he ate his shoe. Taro ate his shoe. Or Taro ate his hat. It's a funny thing to do, but a perfectly normal thing to say, if that's what Taro did. But now, you can't say Taro ate. Taro ate means he ate his sandwich, or he ate breakfast, or lunch, or something normal. Not his shoe, or his hat, or his words. Taro ate. But he didn't eat his shoe. How do I know that? How does any speaker of English know that? The taro ate doesn't mean that he ate his shoe. Now let's extend that by analogy to new utterances. Now I suppose taro's a farmer. Suppose the same child hears the sentence, John grows tomatoes. 
uh, and knows that growing is something that a person can do when something gets grown, so that's just like John eats an apple. Uh, and now suppose tomatoes is dropped, so we have John grows. Well, now the sentence does not mean John grows something or other, but I don't know what. In fact, John grows means something totally different. Doesn't mean the same thing at all. John is undergoing some sort of a development. Now here the analogy is wildly broken, uh, yet we all do this instantaneously, without training, without experience, uh, and in a way which is based on principles that are quite common to the human species and underlie our very understanding of language. Pretend you're sick, okay? I got called a We might ask how old a child has to be before he begins to appreciate something of the grammar of his native tongue. Okay. Told you, give him some Come on. When does he know about ideas like subjects of the sentence uh, and objects of the uh, sentence? When does he know the difference between the horse kicked the cow and the cow kicked the horse? That the subject is the one who did the kicking and the object is the one that got kicked. Experiments at Temple University try to learn how early the child knows. Where's Big Bird? Find Big Bird. Huh? Where's Cookie Monster? Find Cookie Monster. Where's Big Bird? We present two films, one on the left screen and one on the right screen. Mama. Then we simply ask the child through a centralized speaker, Where's Cookie Monster washing Big Bird? Find Cookie Monster washing Big Bird. So the question behind all our studies is, will the child look more at the screen that matches the language that they're hearing? Look, Big Bird's feeding Cookie Monster. Find Big Bird feeding Cookie Monster. The remarkable thing is that some of these children who are only 16 months old and who have only two words in their productive vocabularies, nonetheless, are understanding the order of the information as it comes in in our sentences. That is, that Cookie Monster is doing the action and he's in the first position in the sentence and Big Bird is receiving the action and he's in the second position in the sentence. Hey, Big Bird, tickling Cookie Monster. Word order is one of the two devices that languages all over the world seem to use to map the objects and events that are going on in the world, which is a very important part of grammar and may in fact be telling us that these young children have syntax. I think it makes very good sense to think of language as essentially an organ of the mind. And bear in mind that when we, when we use the word mind, we're simply talking about the brain at some abstract level. Now, remember, when a child learns a language, the child is basically creating the language. The language is growing in the child's mind. Does this apply to words? Surely words don't exist in the child's mind. Yet we learn words so easily. You might wonder if our brains give us some special help here, too. The problem is how the child learns the meanings of words. Seems like a simple problem, and I suppose it is a simple problem from the point of view of a child. <coughs> the mother points to something in the world, let's say the car that's going by there, and says, car. So the child says, aha, the word car in English must mean car. The trouble is that can't be the whole story. When my son was little, we had a dog called Nunu. This is his successor, Freud. And Nunu was a wonderful dog, very different from Freud. She had hair all over her face and two black, shiny nostrils stuck out from the middle of it. Nicholas loved Nunu. He liked to poke his fingers in her nostrils. And as linguists, we were convinced that Nunu would be his first word. It had the right structure to it, two reduplicated syllables. And sure enough, Nunu was Nicholas's first word. 
But on the very same day, he pointed to a picture of a golden cocker spaniel on a photograph, and he said, Nunu, very different from our own dog. So perhaps the word meant dog in general. But no, the very next day, he pointed to a black and white cow and said, Nunu. So we thought maybe it means animal in general. But then we were in a shop, and he saw some pink furry slippers, like these ones. And he felt the slipper, felt how soft it was, and he said, Nunu. Now what does the word mean? Well then, we were in a restaurant, and our salad was served, and Nicholas took one look at it and said, Nunu. And then he actually ate one of the olives. The question was, when he said Nunu, what did he mean? The trick in learning a word meaning is not so much using it to apply to that which you saw it applied to, but using it in the future to apply to new things. So the child who was introduced to Fido uh, and told, this is a dog, not only has to use the word dog to refer to Fido, but he has to know it applies to Rex, it applies to Spot, it doesn't apply to Felix. How does the dog know that's another dog? Words, after all, have meaning. They're signs. So maybe what we want to say is that a word is something that stands for a concept. But then we have another question. What's a concept? Take a word like house. That seems pretty simple. You ask a five-year-old to draw a picture of a house, and most of them will give you the same square thing with a chimney and a couple of doors and that kind of stuff. So you say, okay, that's a house. But then if you think about the concept, if you start worrying to yourself, all right, what, what does somebody have in their head? Is the meaning of a house in my head different from the meaning of house in that Chinese person's head who lives in a cave? A simple homely item, a clothespin. What else is a clothespin after you learn this word? Well, how about that? Is that a clothespin? In some ways, it's very much more like this object than that one is. To understand what the problem of word meaning is, you, you have to understand how the child picks out a category, a category of things which are relevantly alike. A dog is alive. Is the concept of alive the same for everyone? Do our concepts change as we grow up? What does the word alive mean? Are dogs alive? Yes. How come? Because it has eyes and mouth and teeth and tongue. And it has a wagging tail. Wagging tail, OK. Bark. How about a worm? Is a worm alive? Yes. Does a worm have legs? No. No. Does it have teeth? No. Well, then how come a worm is alive? Because it moves. OK. Well, then how about a car? Is a car alive? No. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because it moves. Yeah. What do you think? I think it's alive, too. What is a person referring to when he or she says a word? And how do we know? A rabbit scurries by. At Harvard University, philosopher W. V. O'Quine posed a question known as the Gava Guy problem. Suppose you find yourself someplace you don't know anything about. Next to you, there's a man, and you don't know what language he speaks. At that moment, a rabbit crosses the horizon, and the man says to you, Gava Guy. Gava Guy. What does he mean? What do you think I mean? Gava Guy. Yeah. Blue rabbit. <laughs> Blue rabbit. If you pretend that you can't understand my language at all, and I point up there and I say, Gava Guy. What do you think I mean by that? Um, rabbit. <laughs> Look at the rabbit. How do you know I don't mean fur? 
could be animal, a uh, physical object, a uh, hippity hop. Gaba guy. Rabbit. The only evidence is that it's appropriate to announce Gaba guy in the presence of a rabbit. But the rabbit is present only when rabbit parts are present, provided they're undetached rabbit parts. Furthermore, a rabbit is present only when the abstract attribute of rabbithood is manifested. But the abstract property of rabbithood is quite another thing for rabbits. How do you know that I didn't mean ears? Uh, all of these ideas apparently don't come to the child's mind. What comes to his mind is rabbit. Uh, and the question is how this could be. For a child to learn a word meaning, it would help to have certain inherited assumptions. What assumptions? Have you ever seen one of these before? What might an inborn assumption be? Well, this here is called a flimmick. How do you do that? It's called a flimmick. Can I try one of them? Now, what do you think this is called? Flimmick. Oh, wait, this one's open and that one's closed, so that can't be a flimmick. What do you think it is? Yeah. Children are biased learners. They're not open-mindedly considering all the possible hypotheses about what a word could mean and waiting for the evidence to come in. One of the assumptions that they make about words, what words could mean, is they start out expecting object labels to refer to the whole object. So when someone points to an object and says, see the dog, can you put the dog in there? They start out expecting that a label will refer to the whole object, not to its part, not to its substance, not to its color, shape, size, and so forth. Put the ball, put the ball in there. They expect the label that they hear to refer to the object as a whole. Hand me. What other assumptions could they have? You hand me the spud. This one. Why do you think that's the spud? Well, I think because... It looks like yeah, it looks like a spot. That's a good answer. Children expect objects to have one and only one label. Children expect an object to have one and only one name. If the child already knows that that's called a flimmick and he's asked to point to the spud, he can easily pick this object out because he knows that can't be a spud because it's a flimmick. And if it's a flimmick, it's not a spud. Flimmick. Flimmick. Linux. Words seem to be learned one by one, just what uh, the common sense idea might be. Aim it all. You learn language by learning an item, perhaps by explicit instruction, and in effect memorize them. Aim it all. To a large extent, I would say, words might well be learned that way. Aim them all. Sentences surely aren't learned that way. It's my birthday. When you want to use a sentence, you're surely creating something new. And when you understand the sentence that somebody else utters, you are uh, really participating in an act of creation. Each summer, I go to Puerto Rico. And my grandma lived there. But before, she used to live in Miami. And she had a dog. And it was named Pepper. You've got a finite number of words. You've got a very small number of rules, and together, you can use them to make up an infinite number of sentences. That's the system. And it's a toy store and an ice cream store. The richness of the concepts that we employ uh, and the minimal character of the evidence on which we've derived them essentially leaves no alternative but to believe that these concepts are available prior to experience and we're simply selecting them out of a store. And that means that in effect we're sort of born with them. For the claim to be right that the human species has a common human language, wouldn't we have to find it being used even in far off places? Like Papua New Guinea, here on this island, many tribes with many cultures have lived apart from the rest of the world for eons. Are their languages anything like ours?
This region, Melanesia, contains 0.1% of the world's population and about 20% of the world's languages. There's nothing like this country in the world linguistically. This country has 750 different languages spoken by 3 million people. Some of them are as different as English from French, some of them as different as French from Chinese. The many people have never written their language. They've never invented the wheel. But they speak a language that has as complicated a grammar and discourse structure as any other language in the world. Carl Whitehead of Manchester, England, has lived here with his family for 10 years. To complete his study of the Menya language, he thinks, may take him another 10 years. <laughs> The single most remarkable feature of the Menya language is the verb system. Most of its verbs can have anywhere between 2,000 and 3,000 different forms. That compares to English, where a verb can have up to five forms. It has a very complex modal system. That is, whereas English talks of I may go, I can go, I should go, I will go, Menya collapses all that into a single word and has about 14 different ways of referring to an event that hasn't happened yet but that could or that will or should happen sometime in the future. That's the genius of Menya. When we start looking cross-linguistically, we find great universals. We don't find dozens or hundreds of different ways of building a human language. We find a very small set of possibilities. One possibility has to do with the position of the verb. You can put the verb at the beginning, the middle, or the end. The menu verb, ariri, can have many different meanings depending on its context. It doesn't occur by itself, so by itself it is meaningless. It's the noun in combination with the verb ariri that has a specific meaning. So, for example, a chingariri means she is washing. Ngariri, he is crying. Pariri, He's rubbing mud on his face. Tagnariri, he's building a fence. Biariri, it is raining. And there's a couple of poetic ones that I really like. The first one is referring to an aura around the moon. Pangwa Tagnariri, which literally means the moon is building a fence. Pangwa Tagnariri. And the other one refers to a special kind of sunset when the whole ground just lights up with a bright orange glow. And the expression is, which literally means the sun is painting the ground red. <laughs> The reasonable first guess from all observers is that languages are utterly different from each other. Now, there are 5,000, maybe more than 5,000 languages spoken in the world. And if you're studying a foreign language, what you notice is how different that language is from the one that you speak. Of course, what you notice are the differences. But in fact, what Chomsky noticed is that these 5,000 languages of the world are really very, very similar. You could even consider the 5,000 so-called languages that are spoken on this planet to be all dialects of one language, human language. 
$60. It was a tremendous change in the research program for linguistics right around the turn of the 20th century. And the leading figure in this change was a Swiss linguist named Ferdinand de Saussure. Saussure thought of languages very much like chess games, that each language uh, has a set of pieces, namely the, the building blocks of the language, the words, the sounds, and they were put together by different rules. <coughs> different languages, of course, have different rules. Interestingly, Saussure discovered every language has rules. There are no languages that are so primitive, for example, that they don't have any rules at all. There's no such thing as a primitive language, or a primitive people, for that matter. And that was an important discovery. Because before the, before the beginning of the 20th century, people talked freely about primitive languages. What Saussure and the people who worked around him said was, oh no, every language has rules. Every language? Everywhere? In the Bering Sea on St. Lawrence Island is one of the last holdouts of a language called Siberian Yupik Eskimo, once thought to have complex rules completely different from other languages. Yet, examined carefully, even Eskimo turns out to be less different than its sounds. One scholar of the language is a native of the island, Darlene Orr. The people here on St. Lawrence Island speak Siberian Yupik, and it is also spoken on the other side, and that's in the Siberian part. Um, it's the only indigenous language to the old world and to the new, spoken by non-colonial peoples. One language, the verb might go in one place. In another language, the sound might pattern this way, but in another language, in a different way. But every language has rules. <laughs> And that means, were you trying to call him? There are two major ground plans, two great options in building a language. Relying on the order of words to convey the meaning of your overall thought, or changing the endings of the words one by one, and then shuffling them around. The reason this word looks so long is because Siberian Yupik Eskimo relies heavily on suffixation using suffixes in a word. There are no prefixes or infixes in Siberian Yupik, and linguists speculate that this is probably the most inflected language in the world, which means that it could have multitudes of suffixes for endings. But this part means being acted upon. This much here means without, and the last part means us. So the whole word means without, without us being sprayed upon by water when you're traveling in a boat. Children seem to love rules. And it's this kind of phenomenon, the fact that children seem to love rulemaking, that has led many people to propose that there's something special about the learning of grammar. The children essentially come pre-programmed, perhaps with some innate ideas about the forms that languages will take. In advance of experience, the child is already equipped with an understanding of the basic structure of any human language. Uh, so we know, even in advance of inquiry, that there's going to be a fundamental invariant core to language. Linguists have come to use the term universal grammar. It's a notion that there's some underlying set of characteristics that are true of all languages all over the world. All human languages have something that is sort of noun-y and something that is sort of verby. They all do. 
All human languages have a way to make things negative. No way, Jose. No way, Jose. All human languages have a way to ask a question. If I'm asking a question, I'll lower my eyebrows. Where are you from? What's your name? Who is that person? All human languages have a way to indicate a difference between just one and more than one. In the Eskimo languages, you have not only the singular, for example, ugaik, one rabbit, ugaik, two rabbits, ugait, three or more rabbits. And so it goes. Each language has a list of obligatory distinctions. Male, female, definite, indefinite, singular, plural, past, present. This is the stock of categories that the human mind uses to schematize experience. And Chomsky asked the question, why is this? Why are languages so similar? Why are they all cut from the same mold? And his answer was, there are fixed invariant principles, fixed invariant structural principles, which are simply part of the human biological endowment and that determine what counts as a human language. It's because the human brain is pre-wired to accept only certain kinds of languages and that the grammatical properties of the languages of the world have those properties that they do because the human mind has those properties. Those things which are true of all languages are the candidates for what the child comes into the world knowing about the nature of the language to which he is being exposed. The child might very well have uh, a plan for what is a possible rule in a human language. So languages can have verbs then objects or objects then verbs, but those are two possibilities that every language has one or the other of. And the child can simply worry about which of those two versions his language has. What he's got to pick up are the particular versions of the rules that everyone else in the community is using. You have this one, you have this one, you have this one, you have this one. Everybody got their pictures? What did your person do before they went to school? They died to school. He did what? They died. Drive to school? Children are designed in such a way to look for rules in the data around them. They're very good at finding rules that are there, and they're very good at even overgeneralizing these rules. What's going overhead? We find everywhere that children take the irregular patterns of their language and try to make them as regular as possible. So just like English-speaking children will say things like two foots instead of two feet, or it braked instead of it broke, children in every language will fill in the missing gaps, fill in the errors, and try to make the language follow a system. They have a clear sense of system. We find that deaf children of deaf parents begin to learn first words and then begin to learn the grammar at the same age as hearing children learning spoken language. And in so doing, we find they make the same kinds of mistakes or overgeneralizations, showing that, in fact, they're extracting out the rules of the language. So if you want to sign, this is duck. If you want to sign two ducks, you probably said two duck. But a deaf baby instead will overgeneralize and sign two ducks like this. So they are looking for some deep principles. They follow these deep principles. If the language chooses to violate those principles now and then, the children seem to say, so much the worse for the language. Ruth says that they're foots. I say that they're feet. What do you say they are? I say they're foots. But there are certain kinds of mistakes that children never seem to make, even when it seems very reasonable that they might make a mistake. Children will be able to ask questions like, what did you eat your eggs with? But no child has ever asked the question, what did you eat your eggs and? Even though that's a straightforward extension of, I ate ham and eggs. Children will hear, uh, I baked a cake for Mary, I baked Mary a cake. They'll hear, I painted the house for six hours. They'll never say, I painted six hours the house. Why don't children make these errors? They're perfectly logical. It's very hard to figure out on the basis of what the various sentences look like, why the child wouldn't make these obvious leaps. If you can say, what did you eat eggs with? Why can't you say, what did you eat eggs and? 
when we imagine a reasonable sort of mistake for a child to make, but never find a child making it, we assume that uh, the mistake would violate some principle or rule of universal grammar. Universal grammar is what the child already knew and doesn't have to learn. What's in here? Ask him what he thinks. What do you think what's in here? Well, um, that sounded to me like monster head. No! No! I know. M and M. What do you think what's in here? Right. Oh, great. An adult would say, what do you think is in here? But Sam said, what do you think what's in here? It's not just a random error. It's not putting the words together in any old way. Rather, it's a mistake that's actually a rule of a number of other languages. For example, in certain dialects of German, exactly the way you would ask this question is by repeating the what. It just doesn't happen to be the syntactic rule of English. What do you think what's in here? He's not born knowing the grammar of English, but what he knows is that languages will fall into these classes, and he won't step outside those classes and create some novel language that couldn't be a human language. We weren't so familiar with them. We'd realized that three-year-olds are among the most exotic creatures on the planet. We usually don't think of them as terribly competent intellectually. We don't let them drive or boat. It's hard to teach them long division. But think about what a three-year-old has done when he's learned how to talk. He hasn't gotten any lessons. All he's done is listen to other people talk. He makes very few errors and unlearns them without having to have been corrected. There are countless logical, tempting errors that he never makes. And in less than two years, he's developed the ability to express an infinite variety of brand new thoughts into words in a way that other people know exactly what he's thinking. There are a number of quite striking conclusions, general conclusions that seem to, that we arrive at as a result of this study, even with our present partial knowledge. Uh, one is uh, uh, a kind of awe at the intricacy and complexity of the mind and its resources. Uh, the, the structures of language that the child automatically constructs on the basis of extremely sparse evidence. A second conclusion is that uh, these intricate, subtle resources must be shared across the species. Since the systems of thought and expression that the child's mind develops are only barely hinted at by the experience available, they must be deriving from the child's mind. But the child's mind is the same whether the child is going to be exposed to one culture or another. And correspondingly, it must be that at their core, the cultural products, including language, uh, are very similar and, in fact, rooted ultimately in human biology. From what we've observed of children learning different languages around the world, it seems to us that the capacity to learn language is deeply ingrained in us as a species, just as the capacity to walk, to grasp objects, to recognize faces. We don't find any serious differences in children growing up in congested urban slums, in isolated mountain villages, or in privileged suburban villas. Children who are abused and mistreated and unmotivated, if they can't hear, language filters out through their fingers. Almost no matter what the circumstances, the language bubbles up. It seems inescapable. Children aren't learning language the way they learn most other things. They're not taught, they're not corrected, they don't even think about it. They just do it. <laughs> Next time in our series on the human language, if language is biological, how did it evolve? Program three, the human language evolves, with and without words.